Good afternoon. I am Kaushal Chari, Dean of the Sheldon B. Lubar School of Business at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. It is my great pleasure to welcome you today to Bradley's Distinguished Lecture Series featuring Dr. Michael Boskin, Tuli M. Friedman, Professor of Economics, and Wolford Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. We are honored to hear his thoughts on a topic that is widely discussed and hotly debated in our country, the anatomy of government failure, making government effective and affordable. And he will be introduced shortly. The Lubar School is proud to host the Bradley Distinguished Lecture Series, which has been a rich intellectual tradition in Milwaukee for 30 years. Through the series, we bring internationally respected thought leaders, scholars, policy experts, and business leaders to speak on major issues related to the global economy, entrepreneurship, and innovation. This series would not be possible without the generous support of the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, a private foundation headquartered in Milwaukee, that is based on the founder's desire to preserve and defend the traditions of representative government and private enterprise that have enabled America to flourish intellectually and economically. We extend our deepest appreciation to the Bradley Foundation, both for its support of the series and its commitment to our community. I would especially thank Rick, Graeber, president of the Bradley Foundation and the other members of the foundation's leadership team who are joining us at this webinar today for their continued support. It is now my pleasure to invite Dr. Kanti Prasad to formally introduce our distinguished guest. Dr. Prasad is Emeritus Dean and Emeritus Bostrom Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Lubar School of Business and has served as director of the Bradley Distinguished Lecture Series since its inception in 1991. Over to you, Kanti. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yes, but, we can okay. hear you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Kaushal. Uh, I would also like to add my sincere thanks to the Bradley Foundation for their generous support of the Bradley Distinguished Lecture Series for over almost 30 years and giving me the opportunity to serve as the director of the series for 20 of those years until my retirement last year. And uh, I would like to also add my thanks to Rick Graber, the president and CEO, its uh, distinguished board of directors and executive leadership team, some of whom are right here with us. Um, I'm honored to introduce our distinguished speaker for the Bradley series today, Dr. Michael Boskin, uh, Tully M. Friedman, Professor of Economics and Wolford Family Senior Fellow of Hoover, at Hoover Institution at Stanford. The last time uh, Dr. Boskin was the featured speaker of the Bradley series was in 2015 and I remember it was in, in Milwaukee and in, in person, um, good old days. And we are very happy to have him back after such a long time and just in time for offering his insights on some major economic issues that are facing the country. Um, as, uh, as Kaushal mentioned, the Bradley Lecture Series today uh, focuses on the subject of making government effective and affordable. As all of you know, um, we, uh, there, there are daily battles going on in the Congress and across the country on just what is effective and for whom and what is, what is affordable. Uh, Dr. Boskin is a preeminent economist who has a wealth of knowledge and experience at the highest levels of government to offer us valuable insights on the subject. Dr. Boskin served as president, uh, as, as chairman of, of President George H.W. Bush's 
highly acclaimed Council of Economic Advisors from 1989 to 1993, during which time he helped originate NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, resolve the Third World Debt Crisis, and the U.S. Savings and Loan Crisis. He helped shape American government's response and assistance programs to the former Soviet-controlled economies transitioning from communism to capitalism after the fall of Berlin Wall. He helped place the first effective controls on government spending. Dr. Boskin is a, a preeminent scholar with more than 175 books and articles on wide ranging topics such as economic growth, tax and budget theory and policy, and economic implications of changing technology. His op-eds, as, as you all are very familiar, they appear regularly uh, in the Wall Street Journal and other leading newspapers. He also writes a, a bi-monthly column on global economics indicated in 145 countries. He's the recipient of numerous professional awards, including the prestigious Adam Smith Prize for outstanding contributions to economics. Dr. Boskin received his BA, MA, and PhD degrees from the University of California at Berkeley. Before I uh, zoom it over to Dr. Boskin, uh, we'd like you to know that uh, Dr. Boskin would answer some questions at the end of his presentation, but you uh, can submit questions at any stage uh, during his presentation using the Q&A feature on, on your Zoom screen. So with that introduction, uh, let's extend a warm welcome to Dr. Michael Boskin. Michael. Thank you for that too gracious introduction, Conti. Uh, it's wonderful to uh, it's wonderful to be here, uh, unfortunately by Zoom, but better in 2D than not at all. But I hope to see all of you at some future time in 3D. Um, I've enjoyed every time I've been able to get to Milwaukee, including for uh, previous Bradley Foundation distinguished lectures. I also want to thank uh, Dean Shari for his gracious invitation, and especially the Bradley Foundation for not only supporting and hosting this series, but for its longstanding, uh, my longstanding relationship with them, they support a graduate fellowship here at Stanford that I, I'm involved with on the one hand. And secondly, um, more generally for their support of sensible uh, research. And I'm gonna have to apologize. I came into my office to do this and there is some construction outside today for the first time in a month. And I'll, so I'll speak as loudly as I can, but I'll apologize if there's a little bit more noise in the background than normal. What I want to do today is talk about um, a generic set of issues and a generic wide ranging set of changes that I think would, will be necessary. They will be difficult, they will be necessary. Uh, it will be hand-to-hand -hand combat in doing any of these, but to try to change the way we make public policy the way we talk about public policy, the incentives inside the government for making public policy. Uh, I am not going to speak directly for, to a large number of policy reforms I've been involved with from President Reagan through uh, most recently the 2017 tax reform and the Middle East, the economics and Middle East peace plan in the previous administration. Uh, I have not been consulted by the current administration. Um, and they range across a wide range of subjects from monetary policy, most importantly in my, for my expertise, fiscal policy, taxes, spending, deficits and debt, things of that sort, regulation and things of that sort. But I'm gonna focus on uh, what I believe is a generic issue and try to go over some simple basics for those of you who, uh, for whom this is a tortuous reminder of a fraction of a lecture in economics one uh, many years ago, I apologize, there'll be only one supply and demand curve put up. But I wanna go through um, what I believe has become an overarching, too broad, uh, too expensive, too uh, imprecisely targeted, uh, too overbearing, too incentive destroying, and too economically dangerous uh, role of government in our society. I don't wanna focus primarily on ideology. I'm 
uh, fairly conservative, but I do believe there's a, there are important roles for government to do. And like President Reagan, who was the first elected official, I got deeply involved with actually, I helped during his campaign design tax policy and some other policies. I uh, did not go into the Reagan administration. I went into the Bush administration. But in any event, since then, um, I've accumulated a lot of uh, experience, interaction in developing, protecting, stopping bad policy and the like. And so I have a variety of, uh, of uh, reasons I'm doing this, but I, I hope to do better than to play whack-a-mole at some point and to uh, improve the foundations of policy making uh, by exposing and highlighting and at times correcting uh, endemic government failures, which I'll define in a moment, and by so doing help make the government more effective for the things as President Reagan would say, we need the government to do adequately funded with tax rates no higher than necessary to adequately fund the necessary functions of government. Um, and I will uh, hopefully elaborate that. So the game plan is for me to have a brief motivation, a brief survey of the wide array of things our governments do in our society that would shock uh, our, our founding fathers. Number one, even Alexander Hamilton, I believe, would be shocked who had a more expansive notion of what the government ought to be doing especially the federal government. But in any event, uh, we'll then go through some examples of, uh, of these government failures. I'll highlight four, we could go through hundreds. They'll range from um, uh, a detailed explanation uh, and description of what can only be described as a serial horror of the train formerly known as Bullet in California that may, may wind up being repeated in the new infrastructure bill, uh, number one. And, some issues about public debt, and then a very, very specific absurd regulation that unfortunately also occurred in an administration I advised, although not on this. So with that in mind, let's start the slides. Uh, my excellent research assistant, Garrett, will be uh, handling these for me. Um, okay, so I wanna focus on the bottom bullet here from in a moment. But if we look at recent polling, besides what we generally observe in the daily in the media and in our interactions with our friends, with uh, pronouncements from elected officials and would-be elected officials, um, 56 of American 20, 15 to 24 year olds, young people believe they will be worse off economically than their parents. And 64% of those over 40 believe their children will be worse off than their parents. That is a fundamental change. Uh, we've occasionally seen stuff like that in, uh, in, a, in the depression, for example, uh, briefly during the depths of the financial crisis gate recession of 2008-9, but we haven't seen it. Uh, this, was, uh, this was quite recently. It also would be fairly, uh, fairly representative of polls taken in 2018 and 2019 when the macroeconomy was good growth was strong, uh, poverty had declined, unemployment was low, et cetera. But there's widespread pervasive pessimism. Um, simultaneously, the percentage responding a great, deal, a great deal or a fair amount, whether they trusted the federal government to respond well to problems is running around 25%. It's up from maybe 20 to 22% in the Trump administration, but we hadn't seen lows like that consistently since early in the Clinton administration before he pivoted to the center. On the analogous question, however, 57% trust state governments and 66% their local government to deal with problems at those levels. Now, some of this is they obviously believe whatever the problems, and they're far from perfect, for sure, uh, state and local governments seem to do a better job of what they're doing than the federal government's doing. But also there can be some sense that there's a misalignment of what should be done at state and local levels versus the federal level. The federal, we're federalizing too many things. Trust is also low, as we're aware, in institutions such as the media, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, but remains high for the military and the police, although the latter you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't know from the mainstream media. But one cause is a growing gap between expectations of, that is what reasonably can be expected of, uh, and promises made by elected officials and what is delivered at reasonable cost. Too often, government programs that promise X deliver uh, 
a quarter of that at four times or 10 times the original cost or misapplied and are targeting people that really don't need uh, the support or the temporary support and the like. So I wanna explore this and I'm quickly gonna go through a wide range of items that the federal government uh, and state governments run through. So on the next slide, we'll see what do governments do? The first thing they do is they provide goods and services, roads, education, police, defense, health. Some they produce, some they pay for, produced by private contractors in defense. Uh, there's some, some private schooling that is publicly financed, but not much. Uh, there probably should be more with vouchers. Uh, roads, some of, there are some private roads now, but they're predominantly publicly finan financed. In the case of roads, and now with the big expansion of the new infrastructure bill, in some joint federal, uh, state, and local uh, mix. They levy and collect taxes. Uh, we all know them. Most of us, I'm sure, believe that our taxes are too high or they shouldn't be any higher in any event, especially if higher taxes don't wind up generating revenue that's used for productive purposes that we could generally support. These are a wide range at different levels of government. They differ a lot globally. The US, it's not commonly appreciated, has the most progressive tax system in the OECD because we do not have a large national value added tax, which is the way the European countries and some others uh, finance their welfare states. Uh, it's, a, it's a large analog of a national sales tax to some extent. They also transfer income and goods with temporary aid to needy families. It's a modest amount now. It's declined quite a bit since the welfare reform of 1996 which I would like to say um, and highlight was a result of experiments done by the state of Wisconsin under Governor Tommy Thompson under a waiver. And that became the national model for one of the most successful reforms of our uh, entitlement system and transfer payment system in modern times, the 1996 Welfare Reform Act. The growing earned income tax credit, which has become for better or for worse, I think it's gotten a little out of hand, uh, a model for using the, ta the, tra the tax system to transfer by refundable credits, lots of transfers of payments to many people, including in the proposed recent uh, current legislation up for debate in the Senate, uh, the Build Back Better plan, so-called, we can argue whether it would build or be better. Uh, in any event, uh, a lot of that is refundable credits also. Uh, it subsidizes housing, it has a, a very large food stamp program called SNAP. And of course, it subsidizes health care with Medicaid and Medicare and the expansion of Medicaid under Obamacare and the health exchanges under uh, health, health insurance exchanges under Obamacare. It ensures socially, uh, most of this is transfer payments, but Social Security retirement, disability survivors, crops, floods, bank deposits, health costs. Uh, so the government is the, the, by far the largest insurer uh, by a large multiple uh, of any, uh, any other entities that insure. And it borrows uh, when it doesn't have sufficient revenue from other sources, primarily taxes, but also some sales of things uh, to cover deficits or to finance capital spending. That's more, more, uh, more recently done at the, more generally done at the state and local level, although there's been some at the federal level. It lends and subsidizes lending. So it borrows with one hand and lends and subsidizes mortgage, student loans, small businesses. It employs workers, clerks, soldiers, teachers, police. It owns and runs businesses. Uh, uh, the federal government of the United States has some that is partly temporarily uh, nationalized and reprivatized. <coughs> In many other countries, <coughs> there's much greater direct government ownership and running of businesses. <coughs> we think of that in state enterprises in China, for example. But it's also true at the height of, uh, of the uh, socialization of the Mexican economy, the government of Mexico at one time owned 39 cantinas. Uh, so this is pervasive among governments all over the place. I'm gonna focus on the US, but this is still being done and includes uh, being done. And one could say that in many ways, uh, the governments uh, either are big silent partners or are less silent partners in many governments, in many businesses by governments 
mandates, regulations, and especially sharing the tax, their profits with tax revenues. It regulates competition with various regulations, antitrust law, insurance, banking, communications, and financial market regulation, some of which conceptually makes sense, some of which is done reasonably decently, and in other cases has been done poorly. Uh, so we'll talk about some regulatory capture in a moment. And it sets rules, laws, traffic, environmental, corporate, international trade, election, immigration, intergovernmental relation, rules and laws, and of course, those rules and laws are constantly being debated and amended at the court level, eventually at the Supreme Court level. And then finally, it regulates money and credit with uh, Federal Reserve uh, control of short-term interest rates and operating as a lender of last resort, or as some people believe, myself included, in, uh, in various episodes in the last few decades, it's become the lender of not quite last resort. So let's go on. Uh, let me remind you of Adam Smith's invisible hand. It says, uh, the invisible hand of the marketplace, the incentives of private producers trying to maximize their profits and consumers trying to do the best they can given their budget, will create a situation where the rate at which we're trading off different goods for each other, guns and butter and the traditional economics one, diagram, but it, pizzas and hamburgers or con in-person concerts and downloads on iTunes. Uh, well, that interaction of supply and demand we'll see visually in a moment equates supply, supply and demand. Every, it's the rate at which we trade off among consumers valuation of different things is set equal to the price and the rate at which society can transform goods into each other by shifting capital and labor and materials from producing one thing to another equals their price. Their, incremental willingness to pay will equal the incremental cost of society produced and all the goods will be produced at minimum average cost under a certain set of conditions we'll explore in a moment. So note that prices will be conveying information to producers and consumers and provide incentives on to them about what to produce, how to produce it, what to purchase, etc. Okay, so let's take a visual look at that very quickly. I promise this is the one uh, reminder of Econ 1 you'll go through here. So let's put up a supply curve. The supply curve, it turns out, if you remember, is the marginal cost curve, what in, the incremental cost of producing each unit. And that'll trace out a curve and that's an upward sloping curve or maybe it's even pretty flat at some stage as a function of price. And the demand curve is just the, tells us the marginal value consumers put on each additional unit if they, if they buy an additional unit and pay that price, they're willing to pay it. If they don't, the price is too high. If they buy more, if they want to buy more than that at the current price, uh, they, may, they may have a higher marginal valuation. So the demand curve traces out the marginal value, roughly speaking, of consumers, and likewise the supply curve, the marginal cost of producers. And they wind up producing what we call an equilibrium at E, uh, at a price uh, PE and a quantity QE in each and every market. There are many producers, many consumers, et cetera. And that's gonna have a particular unique property, uh, which we'll show on the next thing. The top triangle here is called consumer surplus. The bottom triangle, producer surplus. It tells the extra value we get by producing QE than producing any amount less than that. And uh, we'll skip, uh, Garrett, skip the others. I don't wanna go through the others, but it will turn out, just go through them. It'll turn out that that's the optimum amount for society produced and the interaction, the free interaction of people producing uh, whatever they think can earn them the most profits as a producer and consumers uh, allocating their budgets among the things they need to buy, their rent and their, uh, and their clothing and their transportation and their food and their entertainment, et cetera, their education uh, for their children, all that stuff will wind up doing the best they can given their budget and will wind up this equilibrium and the invisible hand will harmonize that through the interaction of supply and demand. And that produces this incredible outcome that markets are incredibly efficient in the sense of we're maximizing consumer plus producer surplus. It's the best society can possibly do. And also technically everything's being produced at minimum average cost. So this is the glory of the marketplace for economists and more generally, I also obviously 
that it's, it's done freely by people pursuing their self-interest. Uh, and let's go on to the next slide. Let's cut through this quickly and go on to the next slide. But the market doesn't always produce uh, under those conditions. We may only have one or two or three producers of a product or a service. We debate what that, uh, whether there are, for example, right now, uh, duopolies in online search, for example. So there's a lot of talk about regulating that. But we've had traditional regulation in areas that are deemed natural monopolies that like telecommunications and other utilities that over time technology and other things have enabled us to have more competition, more privatization and the like. So partly what's, uh, what is a competitive market can evolve over time, including with foreign competition or interstate competition and the like. But if there's imperfect competition, let's go through these quickly. If there are goods that uh, if the government doesn't finance won't be produced in the private marketplace, something like defense, because you can't exclude people from being protected from Kim Jong-un's missiles um, if they don't pay to, to pay for defense, because we can't discriminate in that way. Uh, signal scramblers enable uh, direct TV and, and, uh, and cable television, those sorts of things enable that fine distinction. But in general, for some goods, they don't exist. The private markets wouldn't exist. Externalities like pollution and congestion, we're not taking account of the extra costs we may incur, incur when we jump on a highway and wind up slowing everybody else down. There are ways to harness the market to internalize those so-called externalities external to the market uh, that economists talk about a lot. Uh, but this tends to also get overdone in the political sphere where everybody claims we need to get the government involved to do these things. Let's go on quickly. Uh, markets may not be complete. They may not exist. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of attention about imperfect information uh, that makes it difficult for people to make rational decisions or for markets not to unwind because of adverse selection of risks in insurance markets. If that's technical mumbo jumbo you didn't follow in the Obamacare debate, don't worry about it. And, uh, and of course, market macroeconomic instability. There's no guarantee that the market economy left totally unadorned, unaffected by government, by monetary and fiscal policy to take the recent examples uh, in recent, the last you know, century of uh, in the United States, um, uh, aren't guaranteed to prevent recessions, et cetera. And of course, it may be that just growth is subpar. That may be caused by the government, we'll see in a moment. And of course, the marketplace is uh, not directly focused on distributional considerations. If people have very little skill, uh, they're only going to command very modest wages in the marketplace. Um, and it may be that society believes that some people, because they're too frail, because of, say, they're 90 years old or they're, they have serious health impediments, that we should have some uh, some support for them above and beyond what they've been able to provide themselves or their families can provide. And this is a big part of where the, uh, the big debate right now is should the, the, the government of the United States, particularly the federal government, greatly expand its role here uh, to move toward or even closer to a European style social welfare state. I personally think that would be a disaster uh, economically. Um, and uh, hope to hope we can prevent it or undo it uh, if necessary. Uh, and I'll give you one or two causes for uh, some modest optimism on that at the end of the talk. So let's go on. So President Reagan famously said, uh, he was the first uh, candidate then and then elected official that I got close to in my career. The nine most dangerous words in the English language, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. And that encapsulates the idea that the government doesn't always have a cure that's better than the disease. Uh, the disease may be ill-identified or may be minor. Uh, it, may, it may be more than that, but the government's cure may wind up doing more harm than good. Before I get into launching into all the problems with government programs and examples and the government failures and the taxonomy of them, let's remind ourselves there are many good in government programs. The GI Bill was a great investment in human capital after World War II. All those 
young, young soldiers, uh, sailors and wax and everybody else that uh, kept us safe and free in that great time of, uh, of confrontation and uh, risk and danger and sacrifice, uh, wound up helping a lot of people who had delayed their ability to go to college to serve in the military catch up. Uh, and it was a great investment in human capital by all measures. Social security has helped reduce the poverty among the elderly to below that of the non-elderly. It used to be three times. The military has kept us safe and free, um, but even these success stories had sub failures. Uh, we can argue about um, whether we sensibly withdrew from Afghanistan to take the most, and, and however one thought about being botched, whether it should have been done at all, even though we had a modest footprint. There are other examples where people can argue um, Winston Churchill was often uh, haunted by Gallipoli and that failure, et cetera. Um, but those are primarily military decisions. The military has kept us safe and free in the United States remarkably, uh, and not always obviously in the early part of the Republic, uh, when it wasn't clear we were gonna win the War of 1812, for example. Social Security helped reduce poverty among the elderly, as I said, but it now, has strayed very far from its mission and has become very expensive and unsustainable in its current form. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go on. So the government sometimes fails. It could fail by not doing something about an obvious problem, letting it get much worse. It could fail by a poorly designed and implemented intervention um, that either costs too much or is ineffective or winds up worsening things or has a lot of unintended consequences. And not of enough attention is paid to this uh, by everybody, um, by citizens, by elected officials in particular, and also by my economist colleagues who tend to focus on ways to, uh, fancy ways in the classroom uh, to design clever solutions to market failures. Um, those are helpful, but they can wind up doing more harm than good when uh, poorly implemented. So crony capitalism, we're now we're still subsidizing Tesla, which is worth a trillion dollars. And Elon Musk is the richest person in the world. Whatever one thinks of Alexander Hamilton's original uh, idea of protecting infant industries in the early days of the Republic, so they could grow up and not be overwhelmed by foreign competition. Surely Tesla's outlived that. Pork, uh, commonly described. Uh, the Alaska Bridge to Nowhere is perhaps the most famous recent example. Misguided social engineering. In an attempt to uh, assist low-income people get housing after all the subsidies you already had, we wind up adding more and more subsidies for subprime mortgages, requirements, um, that down payments be reduced to 3%, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had to do certain things, that banks had to have a certain percentage of their lending in distressed areas and a certain percentage of their portfolio in supporting subprime lending. Uh, and that wound up, of course, being a big contributor to the financial crisis and the Great Recession that uh, ensued. Um, so this was the government, perhaps in the early days, some of these subsidies made sense, but they failed to appreciate the law of diminishing returns and kept doing more and more and more, which wound up getting out of control. Now, it wasn't just the government's fault. There were some unscrupulous people, some unscrupulous mortgage lenders. And a lot of borrowers knew that something was fishy because they couldn't get an auto loan, but they were getting $400,000 mortgages. So I'm not just blaming the government, but it set the stage for this by the incentives it created and the mandates it placed on businesses. Rent seeking and, disp and dispensing. California prison guards are paid a tremendous amount. And every year, just, be during the just before the negotiations, um, there is a big, a big set of contributions to the governor or the candidate, et cetera, and they get paid off. Uh, I think it's as almost as blatant as that. And if you wanna hear about a ridiculous government failure statistic, th if you think of nothing else about a mismanaged state, imagine California spends $81,000 per incarcerated inmate. That is more than the median income of a family in California before paying taxes, federal and state and all those other things, the before tax market income. Uh, it's just way out of whack. Regulatory capture in the run-up to the financial crisis, when the investment banks are getting more and more leverage, Lehman, uh, Bear Stearns, et cetera, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs escaped by getting under the wing of the Fed. They weren't as leveraged. 
where they were getting leverage ratios in the 30s, and they, the, the financial regulators agreed to let them measure their own capital. Uh, so we should have known something of that. I had been involved in the previous cleanup, as Conti said, cleaning up the savings and loans. Um, and I had warned uh, the treasury about this, but um, uh, they didn't focus on it till it was too late. Types of government failure induced dependency. Um, there certainly are people who need and deserve our support and our help uh, through no fault of their own or through a lot of bad luck. We don't wanna just leave them left out uh, in desperate circumstances. But we have overlapping poverty programs with tax rate what I mean by a tax rate is if, you, if they go, go work, they start earning more income, uh, the rate at which all the benefits they're getting between Medicaid and welfare and food stamps and the like decline can actually rise up to 100%. So in that sense, they face no incentive to go to work and they're induced to stay dependent. Uh, so there's a lot going on in rethinking that. Uh, one of my favorite Wisconsinites who uh, I got to know back when he was a staffer for Jack Kemp and then wound up uh, rising all the way to Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, uh, spent a lot of time thinking about how to redo these and is, has a project now thinking about how to do them. I've come to the conclusion that we need to basically collapse and eliminate most of these and replace them for people who are able to work with uh, subsidizing wages at the bottom. So people are in the marketplace in working and all the social benefits derived from that rather than being home collecting checks uh, with the same income. Uh, outright corruption, uh, I know you need to look no further than slightly to the South, to Illinois and Rod Blagovich uh, and George Ryan who wound up in the slammer for their corruption. Uh, there've been lots of arguments about the Lincoln bedroom and other situations that uh, we can argue across as a line. It's not as severe, obviously, in the United States or in the United Kingdom, and there still, still exist, and there are obviously gradations, but it's not as severe here, obviously, as it is in lots of other societies where what we think of as corruption is deemed as normal practices, that you're paying people to get a lot to get your goods in, in through the port, uh, through customs, or that it's uh, considered normal that your cousin or your brother gets the contract. Uh, waste and fraud, uh, California's Employment Development Department set a new recent uh, record for fraud. It wound up having estimates as high as 30 billion, but documented at least $20 billion of fraud in the last 18 months with the expansion of unemployment insurance during, um, uh, during the COVID epidemic. And some of that was going to inmates in Florida prisons, to Nigerians, et cetera. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Michigan has documented 4.1 billion. Many other states have them. I'm sure there's a, at least a little bit at Wisconsin. Hopefully it's better run than that. We'll talk some about how this occurs a little later on, but this is the same EDD that the, while allowing all that fraud had many, many, uh, had over a million uh, claims for unemployment insurance uh, backlogged for months at a time when people were desperate in the early days of COVID. And mission creep, social security for higher incomes. FDR's mission for social security was to quote, to secure a measure of protection against poverty ridden old age. It certainly has mostly succeeded in that, but if you had the maximum taxable earnings throughout your career, which would be $140,000 or so now, non-trivial, but not, uh, not Jeff Bezos for sure. Um, if you were at that level, uh, which would put you in the 85th or 90th percentile of, uh, of earnings or something like that, um, you, would be you would be eligible to collect double the poverty rate just in your social security benefits, not counting other pensions and savings. So a lot of mission creep has become very expensive in order to buy votes. As my colleague, uh, John, Show uh, John Kogan has uh, demonstrated in a great book called The High Cost of Good Intentions. It's about the growth of the entitlement state. Let's go on. Governments also tend to wait until they're forced to act in elected societies. We have this continuing resolutions, debt ceilings, and these long battles over everything. It's difficult to commit future legislatures. It's difficult to bind a future legislature. They can always enact a new law that undoes an old law. But increasingly, budget gimmicks are trying to force this with phase outs and 
uh, and triggers and all sorts of things like this, where it becomes more difficult to undo something. Uh, future generations, undo something you haven't paid for in particular. Future generations don't vote except as their interests are reflected in their parents or grandparents voting. So deficit spending has become explicitly or through gimmicks, the default option for spending increases and in tax cuts. So I had supported some of those tax cuts and continue to believe we should reform our tax code to have lower rates on a broader base of people and activity. Uh, but in any event, deficit spending has become the easy way out and increasingly disguised until it actually, in, in the passing of the legislation, until it eventually shows up. And they also systematically ignore long run costs to provide short run benefits. The unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare, underfunded state and local pensions, deferred maintenance. For example, the previously mentioned Employment Development Department of California is still using 1960s hardware and software, uh, which is impossible to maintain as part of the reason we have all this fraud. And we had recently a disaster at the or Orville Dam where the causeways uh, uh, leaked, we had to, uh, we had, broke, we had to evacuate a quarter of a million people. It's now gonna cost billions of dollars to repair. And the routine, uh, uh, routine maintenance reviews demonstrated these problems, but the state did nothing. Uh, including budgeting for these things uh, episodically. It's also easier to give something, spending or a tax break, than take it away once given, perhaps rooted in psychologists showing that there are stronger reactions to negative than positive information or reinforcement or shocks. There are two examples, I was involved in both of them, uh, that were shut down, general revenue sharing, which President Nixon in, 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 uh, enacted in the 1970s, to send more money uh, than traditional to lower income states, generally in the South, with the hope they'd spend more money uh, on services for poor people. That probably didn't happen as intended. Uh, they had maintenance of effort provisions, but probably didn't act as intended. In any event, made the local politicians popular having that extra money to dispense to run against those Congress men and women in the subsequent elections. So it was, it was eventually after a few years disbanded. The other that I'm aware of is the Resolution Trust Corporation, which we set, set up to, uh, to acquire and dispose of the bad assets of the uh, insolvent savings and loans. And we put in some very special features that made it very difficult for do anything other than self-immolate. Uh, but generally, it's very hard to get rid of a program once it occurs. They're reformed, they're adjusted, they're sometimes scaled back. I'll talk about that toward the end. Finally, they try unsuccessfully to circumvent the laws of economics, even something as basic as supply and demand, and even the laws of arithmetic. President Biden ran around saying his plan cost nothing, zero. Uh, very strange. Um, but in any event, that's an extreme example. There's a lot of other jerry-rigging of numbers. Um, they enact programs, especially in boom or crisis, with large unintended consequences. When we're in a deep problem like the COVID crisis or the Great Recession or if far worse, the Great Depression, uh, when there was far less of a safety net uh, and it was much worse. Uh, when we're in that sort of a crisis, the humanitarian need is exigent uh, and it's hard to imagine a time when you won't need something. Uh, and so it's difficult to have these programs automatically expire or they tend to be extended if they're not made permanent, extended for too long a period. Uh, but in a boom, there's an analogous or mirror image problem. Everything seems affordable. So in the 60s with the economy in a boom growing rapidly, people were extrapolating that growth over decades and they didn't assume that we would have problems funding our entitlement state. So we, ex we developed Medicare, we expanded social security in the early 1970s uh, and the like. And that was a time of very different economic which was probably predictable, and demographic, which was surely predictable, circumstances with a much higher ratio of workers to retirees than was going to occur through time. And we should have known these would be unsustainable in the long run, but uh, they were built in to grow and grow and grow and are still set to grow and grow and grow. But the main point is the bottom line in evaluating any government program or policy or proposal, you need to compare the likely effect of the actual policy in the real world not the theoretical thing Boskin or his colleagues or his intellectual opponents draw up as a 
suggested solution of the imperfect government interventions that occur all the time in the real world to imperfect market outcomes that occur in the real world. Now let's talk about some of the consequences. They're big, I'm not gonna elaborate them in detail, but the first and most obvious is they fail to address potential problems adequately or at reasonable cost. Second, they waste resources. Most obviously, duplicative programs are endemic in government, especially in the federal government. There are 46 separate job training programs in nine agencies costing over $20 billion a year, most of which don't keep track of their, of their people who go through them or are, their graduates produce very poor, get very poor results. So obviously, great opportunity to consolidate, modernize, update, spend half the money, help many more people actually get jobs that exist in the real world, not the dreams of some uh, social engineering bureaucrat. They undermine trust in government, including support for the important programs that governments do, defense and others, okay? uh, either by crowding out the funding or by undermining the view that the government can be efficient and effective. They cause higher tax rate and more debt, which slows economic growth and reduce economic mobility, upward economic mobility, which are very harmful to our society and are very unfair to future generations. The same thing's true of regulatory overreach and capture and the growth of the administrative state, which is like another set of taxes on top of the income and payroll and corporate income taxes and so on. There are almost 90,000 federal rules, uh, 4,300 4, new laws from 1995 through 2016. Quick arithmetic suggests that's um, over 20 years, that's like uh, uh, 200 laws a year, okay? Pages of the Federal Register in 2020, there were 70,000. They were all time high in Obama's last year of 96,000. The tool we generally use to evaluate programs, uh, not, always, uh, not always done properly, often abused in the political process or, uh, or basically co opted in the political process, is called uh, cost benefit analysis. It's required of government agencies and departments. For regulations enforced the agency by the uh, inside Office of Management Budget and other parts of OMB and Treasury, et cetera, are supposed to evaluate tax and, uh, and spending. It's an extension of the economic logic of supply and demand, very similar to tools used by private businesses in evaluating investments. The government has to account for that consumer surplus I showed you. Businesses can't collect it, they just collect the price. Uh, it collects tax revenue and it has to account for real, not imagined or exaggerated externalities. But unfortunately, it's often politically distorted. I'll give you two recent examples, but they're far more endemic than this. CBO, uh, Congressional Budget Office, issues a report on infrastructure in which it says the main thing we can do to get better returns on our infrastructure investments is to uh, make better and more frequent use of cost benefit analysis, unbiased, unpoliticized cost benefit analysis. That's been ignored in the recent discussion and passage of the bill. President Biden, one of the first things he did when he assumed office was to an issue an executive order that cost benefit analysis make, must take account of unquantifiable quantifiable benefits uh, for equity in the environment, all that. Now look, there are issues of equity in the environment and there are ways to try to go about that sensibly and straightforwardly in a way that may do more good than harm. But this is just an invitation for the bureaucrats to say, uh, I'm gonna kill this thing I don't like because it doesn't do what I want it to do on these things. And that's even getting the level where it's being demanded of the Federal Reserve uh, add mandates for um, uh, inequality and climate change to uh, what it's doing on uh, employment and inflation. So this is something that I think is a very dangerous move to uh, radically uh, uh, distort and co-opt cost-benefit analysis. Let's go on. It's also important to realize the true cost of government spending taxes and regulation. The aggregate cost of regulation in the economy is well over a trillion dollars per year. So that's roughly the revenue from the payroll tax, for example. Uh, there's been this tremendous growth of the administrative state, um, which uh, continues to proliferate rules and regulations. 
But the most fundamental point is it cost, it costs society more than a dollar for the government to raise a dollar. This is not adequately understood, is often ignored and not commonly enough expressed. Okay. First, obviously, there are costs to administer and to comply with the tax system. If I had been giving this talk in last March or early April, you would have been very familiar with uh, the costs you're dealing with to comply with uh, the income tax or your business taxes. Okay, billions of hours are devoted to that, which are a cost. But worse yet, taxes distort incentives in the economy. The income and payroll taxes distort incentives to work and for firms to hire. Corporate taxes reduce incentives to invest uh, and therefore expand the capital stock and make our workers more productive and increase wages and incomes in the future. And the economic cost of these taxes, this is the main point, rises with the square of tax rates. It doesn't just go up if the tax rate goes up, if the tax rate doubles, the harm quadruples. It's important to appreciate it. It's not a doctrinal issue. It's taught in every introductory economics course. It has to do with the area under demand and supply curves. In the simple linear example, the area of a triangle. Uh, but in any event, let me not get into the technical thing. Please trust me on this. This is widely accepted and understood by economists. Some choose to ignore it, but it's, it's a simple basic fact. Okay, so this is important to appreciate. Now, let me finally, before I get to examples, um, get to how policy is implemented and it's identified by elected official uh, interest groups and amplified by the media, okay? We have an issue, maybe it's a problem. A response is proposed in legislation or regulation. Sometimes it's based on often loosely tied to analogs taught in classrooms. Maybe these people have remembered from their college course, they have advisors. Elected officials, candidates campaign on generic response to these issues. George W. Bush had some very general things he wanted to do about rebuilding the military and so on. Mitt Romney had a 57 point plan in a book before he published, right before he announced his candidacy. Uh, so those are examples, but this is, uh, you know, Biden said he was gonna deal with climate change and a lot of other things. And then he and Bernie Sanders had a concordat and they agreed on a variety of things they would do. Some fractions worked their way through Congress and administrative agencies, the laws passed, but increasingly it charges agencies to write more rules about how it was implemented. They'll say the secretary of HHS shall write the rules to, in, uh, to enable this particular provision. Okay. The rules and regulation are often posted for public comment review, which may or may not result in adjustments. The private sector responds to the laws and regulations. Actually, they may have started to do so in anticipation. This often results in complaints and lobbying, some valid directly or because of unintended consequences, and sometimes inducing or forcing changes or reversals. Sometimes they end up in the courts, which would take a long time and require the rules or regulations be canceled, reversed, or reconsidered. Uh, and finally, the cycle is continuous because few issues, problems, government responses wind up being unchanged over many years. Um, so this is a cycle of repeats. So and my point is at every point in this process and every link in the chain, there are avenues for things to go wrong uh, and for things to wind up deviating from what might be a well-designed, effective, uh, con con uh, con con uh, contained, cost-effective response to a problem. Okay. So examples, high-speed rail in California is perhaps the single worst uh, example uh, at the state level in recent years. And I'm sad to say it's my home state of California, which used to be an example of better government decades ago. The proposed, the host, proposed high speed rail was supposed to go from San Diego to California, San Francisco. In 2008, the cost was supposed to be 33 billion, expected service starting in 2020, and voters approved $9 billion for bonds on the assurance the rest would come from the federal government and the private sector. In 2012, the cost estimate was raised to 100 billion. That produced an uproar, 3X, we haven't even started yet. And the High-Speed Rail Authority soon thereafter had another press conference and said they had gotten the cost down to 68 billion. When asked how that happened, the reply was, it was due to the optimism of our engineers, honest to God. Buried in the report were substantial changes. I'll mention how they got down to 68 in a moment. Uh, and it's just an outrage. Today, the projected cost is over 100 billion and faces an uncertain start date. They've got a little bit going in the Central Valley, but the full program may or may not ever get off the ground. 
When drilling was started in the Hatchby Mountains north of LA, in an area that had never before been seismically mapped, it was slow and there were tremors, so they had to cancel that part. And the rail authority said, we'll shift the first segment to go from the Central Valley, from the Bakersfield, Fresno, Merced area to San Jose, south of San Francisco, rather than Los Angeles. So far, some work has commenced on a proposed leg between Bakersfield and Merced, but has been plagued by delays and cost overruns. In 2015, Governor Newsom, apologies for the E, that's a misspelling, agreed to go ahead with the initial leg to avoid returning 2009 Obama stimulus funds. Let me dwell on that. California in 2009, in the February 2009 bill, they got money from the federal government to build high-speed rail from a bill that was supposed to prevent unemployment, prevent people from being laid off. Six years later, <laughs> an initial leg was started in the Central Valley. Let's go on. When construction was approved, it was promised that passengers could travel from San Francisco to Los Angeles in two hours and 40 minutes, hoping to decongest LAX and SFO, the airport, the main airports in San Francisco and LA. Trains would be operating at speeds higher than almost all systems in the world, including in Asia and Europe, where they're going over denser corridors than in California. To reduce the cost, however, the reform that reduced the cost from 100 billion to 68 billion, allegedly, it's now back up to 100 billion, of existing, a fair amount of existing track would be used that would slow the train down, which would mean less riders and less revenue. With the whole thing in doubt, there now is a, a, a movement among Democrats in the legislature, which is super majority in the California's legislature to kill the project. The states seem to be waiting for a partial bailout, at least from the Biden administration infrastructure bill. So this would be throwing bad money after horrible money. Okay, let's go on. Another, Consequences are very poor state of K through 12 education for disadvantaged children. Uh, we have many good schools, many very, very hardworking and capable teachers, including in many good public schools. But the US is outperformed in standardized tests internationally. We have far fewer top performers, far, far more low performers. In my home state of California, eighth graders, just under half meet English standards. It's a majority minority state now, so perhaps some of that's understandable. Just over a third meet math standards. Pardon me, for minority students in big city public schools like Los Angeles public schools, it's far worse than that. And there are several San Francisco high schools, for example, where not a single minority student has passed even one AP STEM class with a passing grade um, in several years. So we're badly failing. There are many reasons for these problems. Not all of them are the schools, not all of them are the school. The teachers unions, I believe, are part of this problem. They're not the only thing. Some of it has to do with what's going on earlier in the home and a variety of other things of that sort. But we're doing a poor job. Governor Brown decided the way to deal with this would be to shift funding, a lot more funding, to low-income schools from the standard formulas that have been previously used. But so far, there's been no apparent improvement. Maybe over time, that'll happen. But so far, it seems to basically accomplish zero for the bucks that are being spent. Now, my Hoover colleague, Rick Hanyashek, estimates last year's COVID school shutdown will cost students over 3% of their lifetime income from all the education they lost that they won't fully be able to catch up on, uh, which is, would really be uh, dramatic and a problem, even if it's only half or two thirds of that number. Uh, so this is, this is a partly government failure, this case, uh, K through 12 education, which is heavily a state responsibility in California, state funded now as they expropriated the property taxes and left much less local control to local schools. Let's go on. Well, this is just a graph illustrating the point I must just showed that our mean scores are around OECD average, but not, not good relative to many countries we compete with. We have a very small, too small a share of uh, top performers to uh, highest share of low performers relative to the OECD average in most of the countries we compare ourselves to. Regulation. Okay. The EPA has had, and look, we have environmental issues and some environmental rules help. Most of them are too inflexible and too costly and can get the same result if restructured a bit. But there are some good regulations that mostly produce reasonable results at not horrific cost. 
But there are some rules that have been thrown out by the Supreme Court. For example, the Obama through some uh, the Obama administration has some of them thrown out. Sometimes on nine no th nine nothing votes, for example, for ignoring costs, they were required to do cost benefit analysis and just ignored the costs. Uh, and let me give you my favorite example. It's not that it was usually societally costly, but it is. It's hard to imagine a rule that is even more ridiculous than this. It's the bizarre case of cellulosic ethanol. Congress uh, demanded we subsidize a product, which unfortunately did not exist at the time. It mandated, it's, this was under George W. Bush, who enthusiastically supported it, unfortunately. It mandated its purchase, though it still did not exist. It punished oil companies for not buying a product that does not exist, which it demanded and blend into the fuel. And the National Academy of Sciences said that there were no commercially viable biorefineries exist for converting cellulose to biomass fuel. So it's not technically possible. It was projected in this legislation that 70% of cellulose in this rule, cellulosic ethanol uh, supply would come from cello energy, a projection made before it built its plant or the technology was proven. Subsequently, a civil fr fraud suit showed its fuel was being derived from petroleum, not plants, and it soon declared bankruptcy. So think of that. We have a process that allowed subsidization of a project that product that didn't exist, mandated the purchase of something that didn't exist, punished companies for not buying something that did not exist, that the NAS said could not exist at its current technology, and wound up subsidizing and projecting the use of the project by a company that fraudulently produced a small amount of it and then went bankrupt. Okay, so this is an extreme example. I don't mean to suggest that all rules like this. As I said, some are pretty good, some are in the middle uh, and can be improved. Uh, but there's certainly far too many of them that are too inflexible. Uh, one of the worst and one of the subjects of my research is soaring public debt. I'll just give a few examples and illustrations as we're getting uh, pretty far along here. Uh, if the Build Back Better is passed in its current form, the $1.8 trillion bill, when adjusted for budget gimmicks, is around $4 trillion, as estimated by the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, a nonpartisan group that includes former budget directors and, uh, and con congressmen and women from both parties. And thus the ultimate cost, because it cost about a buck 30 for each of that dollars is roughly 5.2 trillion. The government debt is gonna require financing of interest payments through some combination of tax hikes or cutting other spending. And even before the large deficit spending of the last two years, ostensibly to combat the pandemic and associated hardship, some of which was quite well motivated and some of which was probably a good idea, but much of it was poorly targeted and the stuff we did at the beginning of this year probably didn't need to be done. Uh, the federal debt was already due to explode as we'll see in the next two pictures, uh, the next picture. Okay. On the left is the publicly held debt held, this was at the eve, this was before the pandemic to give you an idea, so this is something that was caused by the recent deficit spending. The publicly held debt was already, that's debt held outside of the government, was publicly held at 116.1 trillion. The actual deficit in social security is estimated by social security was slightly larger, a bit larger than that by the Congressional Budget Office. The actual deficit in Medicare was a multiple of that. So combine the actual deficits, the unfunded liabilities is currently projected of social security and Medicare, if they're not reformed, their spending growth slowed, is three times the regular national debt. Okay. Let's go on. This would imply, remember Reagan said we should have tax rates at a level to adequately fund necessary levels of government. To finance projected government spending on entitlement growth, marginal tax rates would exceed 60% for many in our population, not just a few rich people, and be higher still at the top, whether through higher income taxes, probably most likely, or maybe higher payroll taxes or a combination. And obviously that would cause headaches. It's hard to imagine a robust economy, a robust capitalist democracy where a majority or a large fraction of the working population was a minority partner at the margin in their own labor with the government getting a majority of their incremental earnings. Okay, let's go on. These long run imbalances occur not just due to demography. That's a very bad misconception. It's around 50-50 between uh, demography and rising real benefits per beneficiary in social security, which are built into the system. 
current tax rates are sufficient to pay for either rising real benefits or the almost doubling of the ratio of retirees to workers, but not both. If the level of benefits at retirement, which is current, your, where your uh, earnings histories are indexed by wages, which typically, not this year, but typically grow more than prices, uh, that's your initial benefits. Then once you retire, your benefits are increased with the consumer price index. The actual deficit would actually disappear if we switch to wait from wage indexing to price index indexing of the initial earnings histories. That wouldn't cut anybody's benefits. It would, people wouldn't get the, the quote benefit of the benefit, real benefit growth, but no one would pay lower benefits than, uh, than currently. Okay, let's go on. Medicare, it's 2080, uh, which means that even if the recent slowing in healthcare cost growth continues, it's not just temporary, that we're gonna be spending instead of one out of every uh, $7 on healthcare, we'll be spending on the extra incomes we have over the next half century, we'll be spending one out of every $3 or, or something like that on healthcare. Uh, and it's hard to imagine we don't have other needs where that makes sense. Okay, let's go on. So some solutions. Um, there are, first of all, there have been rollbacks of government spending taxes and regulation in the mid eighties, to the mid 90s, government spending as a share of GDP was reduced five percentage points in the US and Canada. I participated in some of that, uh, not as well as I would have hoped to have been able to do, um, but that is an example. European welfare states are trying to claw back their excesses. They roll back regulations using the Congressional Review Act now. By the way, uh, the Dutch declared a few years ago they're going to stop being a welfare state and want to become a participation society and now require people getting benefits to take a job if one is available within three, a three hour commute. So there's some attempt to pull back here despite in here in our country now, uh, the Biden proposals to greatly expand this on top of what we've already done. Uh, attempts to redress and prevent government failures have to be ongoing and continuously managed. It's unlikely there are one or two silver bullets. I'm gonna to point to a few things in the next couple of minutes and then throw it open for questions. Okay, let's go through this quickly, Garrett. First, we have to change in information and incentives, hiring and promotion incentives and pay scale, merit pay in schools, for example, strongly resisted by the teachers union, uh, is the only way we're gonna get uh, the internal dynamics of teaching to match uh, improvements and real outcomes. Uh, I believe more choice would generate that, more uh, school choice, vouchers, uh, government subsidies of vouchers, et cetera, would be various ways we could pressure to have those things accomplished. Budget reforms make it more dis difficult, at least temporarily, to bypass or overrule cost benefits analysis of spending and regulation. And also devolution uh, more to the states. Uh, there have been some ideas about this. Nixon had some, uh, President Reagan had some that didn't go anywhere. Alice Rivlin, a, uh, a Democrat, head of the OMB and CBO, um, uh, proposed some in a book uh, uh, in the early 1990s about adjusting responsibilities, reducing the role of gov federal government in lots of things and um, block granting more stuff. The 1996 welfare reform was one shining example of that was block granting with far fewer uh, restrictions on funds to the states for welfare. Go on. We need also to constrain budget choices uh, as best we can. Um, if budget choices are reflecting either a but alleged benign social planner, which I have a hard time seeing, of normative welfare economics, or the preferences of voters, why would they need want to constrain themselves? Well, we have lots of interesting examples of behavioral self-control models and, and experiments that people do on their, on their own. And more importantly, we need to protect future generations. Uh, I propose partly as a, um, as a uh, exper a, th a thought experiment, a voting trust, where the trustees would have to vote the interest of future generations about such things as social security reform or expansion. Uh, can we successfully constrain future choices? Well, a new, a new Congress can and often does change the laws, so it could obviate constraints. If constraints do binding, it can be broken. Okay. There are some that operate in today's public sector, just real quickly, real quickly. The EU has uh, pressure to improve public finances with its growth and stability pact. 
deficits above 3% of GDP are allowed only if there's a severe recession. Although that has not been adhered to. Uh, uh, the problems occurred in Italy, France, and Germany. The rules were pushed out. They were uh, temporarily waived, et cetera. Um, and the Greek uh, problems caused a re-examination. There was discussion of a, what was politically unpopular in most countries, fiscal union, uh, to more mimic the United States among the states. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I think for everybody that has not occurred. The states, also many local governments here and around the world, have balanced budget rules for operating budgets. They allow borrowing for capital expenditures like building a new school. Uh, in California, you're not supposed to borrow for operating expenses more than a few hundred thousand dollars. Line item vetoes for executives, super majorities for local bond issues in California for tax hikes. Legislatively, they're trying to get around that now and trying to change the, the constitution sometimes. And some have supermajority legislative requirements to pass a budget. So on. Federal government had some process constraints. I'll talk about those as I finish, and, but uh, they've mostly expired as well as been ignored. Okay. There are balanced budget amendments uh, come up all the time. A bunch of states has have ratified a balanced budget amendment. We're nowhere near what's necessary to pass one. Uh, it would have to have a lot of provisions for opting out in a recession to avoid worsening temporarily a recession. And there'll be a lot of debate about what counts as spending and what counts as taxes to measure. Uh, we don't have a line item veto. President Reagan demanded one, but the courts have ruled that's, an un, uh, that's violating the separation of powers. We have put explicit spending caps, which have temporarily, uh, temporarily been adhered to. We've had pay-as-you-go rules that required any spending, uh, entitlement spending hike or a tax cut to be offset by other tax increases or spending cuts. Those were renewed on several occasions and at times have reappeared briefly, but they don't exist now. Uh, super majorities, as I mentioned, there's quite an intellectual foundation, unlike the discussion we see in the popular media, for super majorities. Uh, consider the following thought experiment. Something is worth doing for society, which implies in some sense that the benefits of society outweigh the cost. Well, that must mean that there's some assignment of the cost to each and every person or family in society, such that the benefits they get exceed the costs they have to pay which would mean everybody would vote for it if you found the ideal solution. Now that's not practical. The great Swedish uh, philosopher and economist Ludwig Sell over hundred years ago uh, came up with this idea and had a qualified majority. Uh, but that idea suggests that for many things the government does, we ought to force the legislature to find a way to pay for something that actually, um, leaves most, if not all people better off, not to just fund things with the existing, uh, existing payment system or to raise taxes on one group to fund another uh, that's getting little benefits other than um, uh, a bad outcome. So there's intellectual foundation. I don't have time to go into it. We're about to conclude. And we have to do a much better job of managing government agencies and programs. I helped uh, Bush 43 uh, design something of this sort that he ran on and put something in um, and there are regulatory budgets uh, that um, are the analog of regular budgets that expose these costs. There have been use of the Congressional Review Act, a two for one rule. You have to get rid of two rules for every one you put in. But of course, you could have one with a lot of costs and two with a little. Um, but importantly, we need to start getting some independent cost benefit analysis that can't be, that at least is publicly presented before anything is voted on and has to be absorbed by the elected officials. and. Uh, by voters. Let's go on. Uh, and of course, debt limits, sequesters, continuing resolutions are all exist in the real world. Okay. So the reforms include just reinstating these things or amendments of them that have worked in the past. Uh, some have proposed a biennial budget cycle. So Congress could work on the budget one year and then evaluating the programs to be able to get rid of the ones that don't work anymore or reduce them or reform them in the other. Um, that's, that's a potential, a lot of states do that uh, and that seems to do better by them. They sunset provisions for programs and regulations we don't make nearly enough use of uh, other than now it's becoming common budget gimmickry in the reconciliation bills. 
zero-based budgeting. It's too often the case that we look at increases in spending or how much it's going to rise from the current level uh, rather than how much of the current level is justified. Phil Graham was a big proponent of that. A separate capital budget, if we can figure out ways to avoid it being uh, co-opted, where we actually dealt with things like deferred maintenance, um, dealt with things like not updating your IT infrastructure and so on uh, and the like, and requiring super majorities, um, which would probably require reforming the Budget Reconciliation Act, which I think um, has been greatly abused and is about to be abused again, probably. It also, as I said, is, has a close relationship to benefit taxes, uh, taxing people who get the benefits like roads, taxing the gas tax or vehicle mile travels tax. And then finally, line item veto, there probably are ways to get something that can pass muster in the court, but it wouldn't be a direct line item veto. Uh, constitutional amendment I've already mentioned. Those are all ideas that are out there. Some are being proposed, but let's go on to the conclusion. So the current attempt to radically expand the federal government's spending taxes debt are likely to do considerable harm. Worse yet, they're being accompanied or there's a backdrop of an assault on meritocracy, even objectivity in teaching math, and that success is somehow racist, et cetera, are insidious. As Adam Smith wisely observed, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but rather from their regard to their own self-interest. That's the most insidious assault that would do the most harm to our societies, undermining people's desire and incentive to improve their lot. A successful society, in my opinion, needs an effective government doing the things we need the government to do well, adequately funded. But our government has become too large and too sprawling. I hope I've at least begun to get you thinking about it if you hadn't already. It's become the first rather than last resort in addressing too many problems. It does too many things poorly, too expensively, and winds up both harming private firms and families unnecessarily and undermining support to adequately fund the essential roles of government. Preserving a robust capitalist democracy will require continuously mobilizing intellectual ideas and political support for implementing and defending reforms necessary to get the government back to a more reasonable keel. Okay, so thank you very much. I probably went a little bit over, but I'm happy to take questions, and I hope I've at least I got you interested in, in supporting people who are involved in or proposing to do these kinds of reforms. So Michael, we do have a few questions from the audience and um, I'll uh, forward this one to you first uh, related to the voting trust idea. Do people really vote in their own self-interest? If I already do my best to vote with the interest of my children or grandchildren in mind, would a voting trust be an extra finger on the scale that overrepresents the interests of the next generation? That's a really perceptive and important question. So first of all, I think on balance people do, but I think we all wear many hats. And, which, uh, and when we vote, we tend to vote for people who represent packages of ideas, which include some of the things we support, some we don't. Uh, many people are saying that, um, the parties have moved too far to the extremes, although they mostly support most of the ideas of one or the other. Uh, in my view, <laughs> it's, not, it's not symmetric, but I think many people would argue it is. So where does that leave us? Um, it, it suggests that um, direct democracy, voting on each item individually is probably not a wise idea for many reasons, including those of Madison about the passions of the moment. Um, but uh, we don't usually vote for a particular reform that will have this. It's for somebody to represent us on that. And they may or may not be closely aligned with it. They, what we wind up voting on may be part of what we want and part of what we don't want, et cetera. But I think by and large on balance and over time, votes reflect people's interests. Now those interests aren't necessarily their pure economic interests. It could be, cultural, religious, um, uh, other types of issues that, uh, that uh, involve their, uh, their fundamental values about things. Um, you know, I I'm willing to pay taxes that do a good job of helping people that are in distress, even though that's not directly in my own economic interest. Uh, so, but in general, I think, yes. On the double, on the double finger on the scales, 
the question is how much uh, uh, the elderly current retirees or people who know they'll be retired in the near future are reflecting the interests of their children and their grandchildren or uh, generations unborn. And there, I think the problem is we don't directly control that. Um, we can control that through our own private behavior, how much we leave, you know, whether we, as we're getting late in life, whether we use up all our assets and leave our children nothing, or we leave them a bequest or something like that. But what we're doing is voting on something of the general population, which, not, which isn't entirely in our interest. So I think, I think the voting of parents and grandparents is only partly reflective of what may affect their children and grandchildren, where a voting trust might be more directly. So the answer is yes, but maybe it winds up, or you can strain it, but maybe it wind up being 1.1 or 1.2 times, not double. Um, we have another comment that says uh, to you that your comments ring true with many of us in the audience. What can you suggest uh, as to how to be effective in making changes to a very large and very broken system? Well, I think you have to uh, figure out who you can support and how to make those changes. Some of you may decide to run for a local school board. It's become a very controversial issue in the country these days. Some of you may eventually decide to run for office. Some of you may support candidates for office that support um, not only um, a more modest and better targeted and more affordable, but a more effective government. Um, that was my view of what Paul Ryan was trying to accomplish, for example. Um, others may have other ideas in that regard, uh, but there are also movements and ideas and institutions, many, by the way, supported by the Bradley Foundation and people supported by the Bradley Foundation, trying to generate these ideas and suggestions and, uh, and mobilize support in favor of them. Others, for example, I spend some of my time training the next generation of people who carry this on when I'm gone. Uh, so there are many ways you can, you can do this and support it. The short run, obviously getting short run immediate results, the only thing you can do is elect more candidates. Right now, I think, um, not to, I don't wanna become overtly political here, but obviously um, a, a Senate that, wasn't, that wouldn't have 50 votes plus the vice president supporting whatever the president wants to do to expand the government, be one way to stop that from happening. Um, but that aside, um, in the medium and longer term, you can support this. You can uh, go to meetings of your school board, of your uh, city council, et cetera. And when, when you think you live somewhere or have evidence of things that are working, it's useful for that to be um, elaborated, explained, the demonstration to be made obvious and widespread and be inputted into other uh, institute, other organizations and governments that are making decisions. Uh, Mr. Justice Brandeis used to say the states are laboratories of democracy. That's, I, I mentioned welfare reform, but taking best practices um, uh, is, is a powerful incentive because sometimes people actually look at what's going on in their neighbor states, their neighbor communities, what worked where they used to live when they moved all of a sudden it's not working. Uh, and so on. So those are, those are many different ways, but supporting uh, people, including candidates for office, institutions that are promoting these ideas uh, and training people to go into public service that are uh, promoting these ideas is perhaps the most direct way. In addition to whatever you can do, demonstrate, I'm sure many of you are business people who have been uh, whacked by regulations which cost you 50 times any any potential benefit uh, because of some obscure way that was done one size fits all or by some, uh, by some 20 something person that wrote a rule or regulation in some government agency uh, that never spent any time in the private sector. So make those, make those that information available and make sure that it is, uh, that it is uh, made as widely available as possible. I think one of the things I've learned through time is that uh, is two things that I'd mention in this regard. One is that saying something once is not enough. Even if the president of the United States, some of whom I worked for or helped get elected, et cetera, starting with Reagan and Bush and Bush and so on, um, has to be repeated over and over again until it be, really is heard by many people and internalized by many people. The second point is um, 
that there's a lot of power of examples and stories and people, I've been an educator for decades and people remember those. I remember my students, you know, who I had in, my, in some class 20 years ago and they tell me perhaps gratuitously, but certainly graciously that I really was a big influence in them, et cetera. And they remember the stories I told illustrating the charts and the graphs and the information and the data and so on. Um, so there's a lot of power in that. So writing those up, if you have those examples, getting them to your representative, getting them in your local newspaper, et cetera. Uh, those are important things to do. Got one last question we're gonna take because we have to have at least one China question, right? Yeah. Um, China through their national champion industrial policies are dominating the solar panel market globally. And now they're doing it electric vehicles and lithium supplies. How can the US deal with such aggressive industrial policies? That's an important question and one we've done a poor job of addressing. We've overdone some domestic industrial policy on things that are not as important, but it's very clear we have both economic and national security interest in rare earths, lithium, cobalt, et cetera. And we badly need to have an accelerated plan uh, of uh, various ways we support and induce uh, American and allied um, uh, opening up of resources in this regard uh, and preventing the Chinese from uh, getting so entrenched that uh, we have no way to compete. Now, we want to distinguish um, when somewhere else is a cheaper, more efficient, effective way to do something that is not important to our security, national and economic. And we don't want to prevent trade from getting the benefits of low cost textiles or something like that. But we, uh, but we do need to recognize there's a domain of security interests and uh, we need a, a better program to do this. We're starting to see some interest in this. The national security industry is uh, industrial complex getting very interested in this. Um, and uh, it should be, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, Alphabet, the parent of Google, uh, makers of Android phones, and Apple are uh, between them worth, what, three and a half trillion dollars or something. Uh, so um, we need to figure out ways where we wind up having diversified supply sources on things that are important to us. And we also need to um, promote the idea in places where the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, starting to take hold about the future costs these countries are gonna do in being locked into China and having large debts to China when things go badly uh, and, uh, and the like, and, which is already starting to occur in some places. And, um, and they need to take those into account when they're making these decisions. Um, I do not believe that the answer is a widespread national federal government industrial policy spanning lots and lots of things. I think it really needs to be confined to the areas where there are legitimate security interests. And there it needs to be done, not only well, but adequately funded to the extent federal funds might be necessary. Wow, what an insightful talk uh, today, uh, Dr. Baskin. And I really want to thank you uh, for all the information that you have shared with us. And we need to really take time to digest and reflect on that. So thank you so much uh, for this discussion today. And these topics are of great importance to our nation. And, and we are really uh, very honored uh, to hear you uh, on this. Again, thank, we want to thank, thank you very much, Dean Chari. I really appreciate it. I apologize, I went a little over when I expected and didn't have enough time to take questions. But if you've accumulated some questions that I didn't have time to answer, if you send them to me, I'll respond and you can share them with your the guests on the call. Wonderful. And so uh, th I, we want to also thank again, uh, Bradley Foundation for sponsoring this wonderful and informative series. And, and last not but not but the least, uh, the audience, thank you so much for attending today's event. And this is a recorded event and you will find uh, this recording available on our web website uh, in, in a few days. So thank you all and have a, a wonderful day.